Good morning. It's great to hear everybody catching up from the week and for the summer. It's uh, great to see some faces back as we've been in and out so much during the summer. It's great as we get into August here and everybody kind of starts settling back in again. But if you're our guest, we're so glad that you've chosen to come and check out First Baptist Church. If it's your first time, we'd love for you to pick up a welcome back there at the welcome desk before you leave this morning. Also, if you want to text welcome to the number you see up there on the screen, we'll get some more information to you about First Baptist Church. Another great, great way to find out about First Baptist Church is uh, through our Discover class, and we have that coming up August 27th. So if you've been coming for a while and you're like, how do you join First Baptist? Or I just have a few more questions, whatever that might be. We'd love for you to come and be part of that class and we can help answer some of those questions for you and show you how you can become part of the church body here. Uh, so uh, you can sign up for that on our church app. You just go there, sign up. Our website has it also there and you can get signed up for that class coming up. Also, we're excited. We have tonight, we have our grown-up camp tonight and tomorrow night. John, is it too late for anybody to sign up? If they didn't sign up, it's too late. They can still sign up today. So if you still want to be part of grown-up camp, they're going to have a great time. Uh, just get on the church app. Uh, registration is still open. You can sign up through there for our grown-up camp. We'd love to have you come and be part of that. Also be in prayer for our college students. They left for Collegiate Week in Falls Creek, Oklahoma this morning. So we'll be praying for them that they'll have a great week and a great time away. Thank you for joining us in worship today. I hope that your summer's going well. I know, uh, I don't, I know, I, I can read your mind already. You're thinking, gosh, if it were just a little hotter, it would just been just perfect. I know that's what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. This has been one for the record books. I know, but we're glad that you're here today. And we just want you to know today's a day just to be free. Be free today. You, you're you're free to, you're free to stand. You're free to sit. You're free to lift your hands. You're free to clap your hands. You're free to shout amen. You're free. Honestly, you are. Uh, you're free. I guess to sit and just look at your phone. I guess, but uh, that's just between you and the Lord. But listen, the very presence of the Holy Spirit, the God, the Creator of it all, is in this place, and we want to worship Him today. We want to honor Him today. So let's do what whatever that takes for our heart to connect with him today. We invite you to stand. Let's sing. Oh, you 
alive in your name. Lord, salvation tide is rising. Lord, we just love you. We thank you. We bless you in your name.
Drenched in tears, they laid him down. 
Wasn't that delicious, church? Just a great time of worship. And that's exactly why we have hope. That's why we don't grieve as those who have no hope, is because we know that one day Christ is going to return, that he will return in robes of white, that that eastern sky will split open, and that we will worship, we'll do what we did this morning for all eternity. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, imagine, if you will, this morning that aliens are real. Now, according to what's being reported... <laughs> Oh. That's a sermon for another Sunday, but just for the sake of illustration, let's suppose that some extraterrestrials, they came down, and they, they walked among us in disguise, and they just sort of took in our culture. And let's suppose that as they observed, here's what they noticed. They noticed that we, we tell jokes about food. And they saw that we, we watch these movies where eating food is graphically depicted. Where when people meet, they're expected that soon they'll enjoy food together that night. Where you can buy magazines with nothing but pictures of food. No recipes, but just scrumptious pictures of food. And they, they observe this. Where we go to websites and we pay money just to see pictures of food. Where one millionaire owns an island... And other millionaires can pay huge sums of money just to go enjoy food for the weekend. Or we, we sell products using food. A picture, if you will, 
a bright red lipstick with a juicy cheeseburger in the background. Buy this lipstick. Now, would our unearthly visitors make the assumption that we have a strange obsession, an unhealthy relationship with food? Absolutely they would. Now, you probably see where I'm going with this. Let me quote C.S. Lewis here. He says, you can get a large audience together for a striptease act. That is to watch a girl undress on the stage. He says, now suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate on the stage. Then slowly lifting the covered plate so as to let everyone see, just before the lights go out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something has gone horribly wrong with their appetite for food? Now, we've been in a series together that we've called Slogans. And what we've been doing is we've been taking popular phrases in our culture that unfortunately sometimes sort of slide and make their way into the church. And we've been sort of analyzing those sayings and challenging them and sort of rebranding them. And so, so far, we've looked at live your truth. We said, well, that's not right. Everybody doesn't get their own truth. There's a single truth that unifies us all together that governs reality. So we said, we're going to live God's truth. We looked at God won't give you more than you can handle. And we all just kind of laughed about that. Because there are times where God allows in your life way more than you have the capacity to be able to handle. But thankfully, God won't give you more than he can handle. His broad shoulders that we can cast our cares on him. We looked at God just wants me to be happy. Now, God's not anti-happiness. But however, he wants you holy before he wants you happy. And in pursuing holiness, you might find what scripture talks about is joy and happiness that sort of bubbles up, that is ever present, even during difficult times when circumstances aren't well. We, we've looked at judge not, a phrase that our culture loves to quote to Christians. Hey, don't judge me. Judge not. However, we saw that in fact we have to judge rightly, that we're all bound to the truth of scripture. And that it applies to me, it applies to you. Last week we looked at follow your heart. Doesn't that sound so cute and sweet? Follow your heart. Your heart will take you to places you don't want to go. So we said instead, how about if we follow Jesus? Now, today it leads us to our slogan that we're talking about. Love is love. A slogan that has been hashtagged over 54 million times on Instagram. Now, before I go any further, let me say a few things, okay? Number one, uh, the content today will have some adult uh, content in it. And everybody's like, what is this guy about to say this morning, right? You don't get that before a lot of sermons. So if you have kids, you might want to keep that in mind. Uh, Number two, uh, my goal is not to be incendiary, but it's to be loving this morning. And three, we can only scratch the surface here. Uh, You know, this is a broad topic. Um, There's a lot of books written. In fact, I I brought a couple. Um, The topic we're going to be talking about this morning, if you want further reading, let me recommend two books to you real quick. Uh, And I didn't write these, so I don't get any royalties off of this. Uh, The first one is Mama Bear's uh, Guide to Sexuality. If you're a parent, highly recommend it. Uh, The other one's been out for a few years, since 2018. It's called Love Thy Body by Nancy uh, Piercy. And uh, incredible, incredible um, resource on biblical sexual ethics, which is our our topic this morning when we're looking at the slogan, love is love. So if you're with me, say amen. amen. All right. If you're taking notes, thought number one is what do we mean by the slogan, love is love? Well, it seems to become, have become prominent somewhere in the early 2000s, and it's been largely used by activists and members of the LGBTQ plus community And it's often used to mean a person can love anyone that they want, which that's true. You're you're your own person. You can love whoever you please. Um, It's it's meant to mean that all love is equally valid. There's a bit of subtext here as well. And the subtext, when people often say love is love, is that all sexual relationships, that all gender identities, and all sexual expressions are equally valid. Love is love. That is to say, sex outside of marriage is valid. Um, Pornography has its place. Gay, straight, couple, thruple, gender fluid, all of that has its place and it's valid. Now, let's ask this question. Has this slogan found its way into the church? 
Because there are many Christians, and maybe you're here this morning, and you say, well, why are we talking about a biblical view of sexuality for Christians? Because we're, we're Christians. Don't we hold a biblical view of, of you know, Christian sexual ethics? Let me give you some statistics, okay? And you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, about two-thirds of Christian men watch pornography at least monthly, at the same rate as men who do not claim to be Christian. In one survey, unfortunately, 54% of pastors said they had viewed pornography within the past year. A Gallup poll found that almost half of teens with religious backgrounds support living together before marriage. 2014 Pew Research study, 51% of evangelical millennials said same-sex marriage is morally acceptable. Uh, and also, let me remind us of this. Uh, right around a year ago, the, the news that surfaced within the Southern Baptist Convention about sexual abuse that was taking place within Southern Baptist churches. Uh, we could talk about what's going on in the Methodist church right now where one-fifth of its churches in the United Methodist Church have pulled out over their stance and views on LGBTQ plus lifestyles. We could talk about pastors who sort of have to play fast and loose with the scripture in order to endorse all forms of, of sexuality. And I'll share one pastor with you. His name's Brandon Robertson. He's an enormous following. He's 31 years old. He's prolific, has over 200,000 followers on TikTok. W incredibly well-spoken. Seems like an amazing, likable guy. But sort of peddles the idea that every sexual relationship and identity one could wish to express has a biblically valid place. So when it comes to sexual ethics inside the church, I would say that the orcs are in the shire, that the sexual ethics of culture have in fact invaded the church. And maybe you say, if you're taking notes, well, Josh, aren't you just being inflammatory? Well, not, I, that's not my goal. Not at all. I, I never want to hurt people. I never want to be a big meanie head. As a matter of fact, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm telling them what I believe Scripture says. And we can dig into it more. I'm showing that Scripture holds us all to the same exact standard of morality. I'm not inciting violence. On the other hand, I'm promoting a biblical ethic of love. I want what's best for Scripture, which I think is what Jesus teaches. And also this, I'll say that I value the truth. That if there's a particular way that reality is structured, a way that we're meant to live, I want to understand that, and I want to do my best to live by it. And when it comes to the slogan, love is love, when it comes to talking about sexuality, I'll often hear this, that Christians are on the wrong side of history. And so some will argue that, you know, when it comes to sexuality for Christians, we should sort of acquiesce and lean into and embrace the sexual ethics of our day, or else we're going to be left behind like a battered old brontosaurus, and we're going to become irrelevant, and we're going to be left in the dust. Let me remind you something. We want to talk about history. In Roman society, which is where Jesus entered into humanity, where Christianity took root, began to flourish. In Roman society, there were virtually no sexual norms. Women were seen as having little value other than to produce heirs. As a matter of fact, husbands would often not have sexual relationships with their wives except for wanting to have children. They would save that for slaves and for, for other people. Slaves were sexually abused. Prostitution was rampant in the ancient world. Males of weaker status were sexually abused by higher-ranking males. Boys were often abused sexually by men as well. This was Roman society. However, once Christianity took root and began to grow and the understanding, that the teachings of Jesus, Christianity brought with it worth, value, and dignity to all people. As a matter of fact, women in the ancient world loved Christianity because it elevated their status. Because Paul preached to men that they should honor their wives, love their wives like Christ loved the church, honor the sexual bed, the marriage bed, and sexuality, and keep it pure. Let me quote Nancy Piercy here. She says, In the ancient world, virtually no sexual activity was considered immoral in itself, as long as it was practiced in moderation. The early church had to muster the courage to stand against a culture in which there were few limits on sexual behavior. 
So from the beginning, Christians have not defended traditional values. They've stood for truth against prevailing cultural norms. The early church may have been on the wrong side of history, but that's why it changed history. And church, I, my prayer is that as an assembly of churches, the modern American church, if you will, that we'll do the same. That we will stand and toe the line when it comes to all things, but specifically this morning we're talking about sexual ethics, that we might change the course of history. Now, if you're taking notes, thought number two, what is love? We're looking at saying love is love. If we're going to talk about that and dig into that, we have to understand well, what, is meant, what do we mean by love? How do we define that term? Well, let's start by saying what it's not. Uh, love is not sex. And to love someone doesn't imply that it must lead to a sexual relationship. However, in our culture, the slogan love is love twists sex and love together. So what is love? Well, in his book, The Four Love, C.S. Lewis points out that the New Testament uses four Greek words for love in different capacities. There's storge, which is affection, like a parent might have for their children. There is phileia, which is friendship. You've experienced that where you love someone in a brotherly way. Brotherly way, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, comes from, from phileia. There's eros, or romantic, or where we get our term erotic, that form of love. And then there's agape, which is unconditional. It's how God loves us. Aren't you thankful for that? Because if it wasn't for the unconditional love of God, there is no way that I would have ever had a relationship with God because of my fallenness. So, love is not love. And as I said, there's many forms and expressions of love. And as Americans, we use the term sort of flippantly. You know, I may say one moment that I love my wife, and then whatever we're having for dinner, I love that too. Now, obviously, I love my wife much more than what we had for dinner. But the, the Greeks, uh, New Testament writers, uh, they use different words to sort of capture those different forms of expression. However, our culture's emphasis when it comes to love is on the re romantic and the erotic aspect of that at the expense of the others. And it makes for something that is plastic and hollow, lacking meaning, it simply won't last. Because the core of love, what I would say must drive relationships, whether it's parental, whether it's friendships, whether it's romantic, there has to be an undercurrent of agape, selfless love. Why is that? Well, because there's times where it's easy to love people. Then there's times where that same person, maybe it's difficult to love that person. And if you're married, you've experienced seasons of this, where some days you wake up and you look at your spouse and you just go, ah, oh, aren't they wonderful? Ladies, is that what y'all did this morning? You looked at your husbands? There's some days where you wake up and you look at your spouse and you go, ugh. You, why do you laugh? Because you know it's true, right? Uh, there's seasons of marriage, there's seasons where it's easy to love and there's seasons where it's more difficult. If we don't have this unconditional current and the relationships that we have, we tend to move from one relationship to the other. Now, what we see in Scripture is that real love is volitional. That it, it's a choice that we make. And so let me share with you a few passages. One is probably one of the more famous passages in Scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved that what did he do? That he made a willful decision to give of his Son to send him into humanity that we might pay the price for our sins. Then Jesus would say about himself, John 10, 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life. This was volitional. Jesus chose to, to die that we might have a relationship with him, that we might have our past and our guilt forgiven, expunged from the record, and be covered in the blood of Christ. That was something volitional, willful, that Jesus chose to do. It was an act of love. John 15, 13 says this, greater love has no man than this, than that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Again, we see this idea that love is a choice that we make, and it's not always an easy thing to do. The Apostle Paul, the, the famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, let me read to you what he says in verses 4 through 8. He says, love is patient and it's kind. Is that not hard sometimes, church, to be patient with the people that you love? to always be kind. He says it doesn't, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. It's not arrogant, it's not rude. It doesn't insist on getting its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. 
It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It doesn't celebrate when other people stumble and fall. But it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, as Paul unpacks what love is for us, what you see in those passages is that love is a choice that we make. It's even when the emotions aren't there. It's even when in, within a marriage when the fizzle sort of fizzles out for a season that there's this commitment that we've chosen to love this other person. That's the way God loves us. So even though we've looked at a little bit of the scriptural data on defining love, let's dig into our, our phrase, our, our slogan, that love is love. And let's notice what the Bible has to say. That is, does the Bible express the idea that all expressions of sexuality and gender are equally valid, should be accepted, and even affirmed and celebrated? Now, I think to understand this, um, we're going to look at something I'm, I'm labeling modern Gnosticism. And to understand what that is, we have to go back a couple thousand years because when the early church was forming and growing, and remember this, the church was growing under persecution. Um, it wasn't like it was an easy time. Christians were dying for their faith, yet the church continued to flourish. But one of the things that the Apostle Paul battled in this time period was this false teaching, and there were other false teachings. Uh, one in particular I want to talk about this morning was referred to as Gnosticism. It was, it's an ancient heresy that the early church had to contend with. What is Gnosticism? Gnosticism was the idea that if you wanted to have a relationship with God, first of all, you had to acquire the secret knowledge. Yeah, the Bible's great, it gives us some teachings, but beyond that, there's further knowledge that you had to get. The only way you could get it was from a fellow Gnostic. They were the gatekeepers, the dispensers of the secret knowledge. But the other part of Gnosticism was this. They viewed all of created matter as evil. That is to say, you're, everything that is physical that you can touch was evil, and everything that was spiritual was good. And so because of that, they developed a low view of the body. That is to say, it didn't matter what you did in your body. It doesn't matter how you abused your body because it's, it's evil anyway. We sort of see that today. What I'm calling modern Gnosticism. The idea that, you know, you can be a follower of God. You can focus on the spiritual. But what you do with your body, what well, doesn't really matter so much. However, when I open scripture, this is what I see in Christianity. But Christianity takes a high view of the body. Well, you say, well, well, how do you know that? Well, I know, first of all, because God created us with physical bodies. Um, we have this physical body. I know that, secondly, because Jesus came not as a spirit or a ghost or an apparition. He came and he walked and he dwelt among us in a physical body, experienced all the agony of dying on the cross. Also know that God takes a high view of the body because when Christ returns, as we sang about this morning, those that have died will be reunited soul with body. And so what Scripture teaches us is that it matters very much what we do with our bodies. That God is concerned that we honor Him with our bodies. And so as we look at the slogan, love is love, I want you to see that here's what Scripture teaches, that sex is always within the confines of marriage. And that anything outside of that, Scripture says, is, is off limits. Hebrews 13.4 let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Now, obviously, sex was God's design. It's meant to be celebrated. However, there are parameters on it. That is to say, it's sacred and doesn't deserve to be cheapened as it is by our culture. I want you to see this, too, that Christianity is not prudish. Anybody ever read the Song of Solomon? There are verses in Song of Solomon that I would feel sheepish discussing in church on Sunday mornings. But yet it's in the confines of Scripture. Again, we're reminded that God takes a high view of the body. Let me read Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 20. Here's what he says. Reinforces this idea. He says, uh, food is meant for the stomach, the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He says, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Did you not know that your bodies are members of Christ, that you are joined with Christ? He says, shall I ten, then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? No. Or did you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? 
Then Jesus quotes the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. Paul quotes the Old Testament. He says, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He says, therefore, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. Then he says this in verse 20. For you were bought with a price. The price was the blood of Christ. He says, therefore, glorify God within your body. There's a lot we could comment on in, those pas- in that passage. But I want to see two things. One, again, that the New Testament teaches a high view of the body. The second thing is this, that we're to flee from sexual morality of all kinds. Now, in his writing, Paul quotes the Old Testament, Genesis 2.24. I'm going to read that verse to you. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, to become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they weren't ashamed. So the design for sexuality from the beginning has always been within the confines of marriage of a man and a woman. So you say, well, what makes a marriage? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about that for a minute. Marriage is two people becoming one in every way possible. Now, before Eve is brought to Adam in Genesis, this was not a possibility. That's why Jesus looked at creation and said, eh, this is not good. So it's two people becoming one flesh in every way possible. Marriage is oriented toward procreation, this creation mandate that we were meant to create, to fill the earth, to subdue the earth, And marriage comes with an expectation of permanence. Jesus said, leave and cleave. The man and the woman become united. They're one flesh. It's this permanent relationship. And so these characteristics of marriage are clear from both Genesis, Jesus' endorsement. Marriage is not a political institution. It's simply recognized as a marriage by political institutions. And so a marriage is still a marriage between a man and a woman, regardless of what the state recognizes, because a marriage contains essential properties. Now, Francis Beckwith says it this way. He says, you can eat an ashtray that doesn't make it food. You can call something marriage that doesn't make it marriage, because a marriage contains inherent essential qualities. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to see our next thought is, is gender bending. Our culture is increasingly pushing this idea on us that gender is fluid, that there is no binary. And I want you to understand this, church, that the way people live their lives flow out of the way people think about things. And the prevailing sort of philosophy of our day, whether you realize it or not, is an idea called postmodernism, which says we can't know anything with certainty, that nothing has inherent meaning. It breaks down language. Now, it says we can't know anything with certainty. You know how I'm going to respond to that. Are you certain about that? And then postmodernism uses language to tell us that language has no meaning. So it sort of cuts its legs out from under itself. And so we see that way of thinking has impacted the way that we view gender and sexuality. And so to say anyone can be a man or anyone can be a woman makes both of those terms have little value and no meaning. I think it's interesting, we don't say anyone can be a doctor or an astronaut. You have to have a certain pedigree to to hold that title. Yet something as ancient as sexuality and gender is now up for grabs and we can't define what either of those mean. And so they, they lose their meaning entirely. If we can't answer the basic question of of what is a woman, and instead we have to let everybody define it as they see fit, it loses its its value. There's really no reason to hold the term anymore. So this idea of destructing language is eroding the pillars of civilization. Let's talk about, with that, transgenderism. Sometimes referred to as gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria or gender confusion. It's the idea that one's biological or genetic or physiological gender do not match the gender they identify with and are perceived themselves to be. Again, the idea is that gender is a social construct, that it's fluid. What does scripture say about this? Let me read it to you. Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so from the very beginning, scripture confirms this binary. Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whosoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. 
You say, well, wait, Josh, that's the Old Testament. We, we don't go by that. Well, Jesus quotes Genesis 127 that clearly confirms this binary in Matthew 19, 4. That there's man and there's woman. Jesus and the rest of the apostles, the apostle Paul, all confirm the Old Testament, the scripture. That is to say, it's equally as valid and binding. Well, there's cer- certain things in the Old Testament we don't go by. That's right. Those were known as ceremonial laws. They were just for the nation of Israel. However, what Paul and Jesus talk about in the New Testament is the moral law that transcends into both covenants or both testaments that we have. Our bodies are part of who we are. And so why bend the body to suit the mind instead of the mind to suit the body? Now, I think it's important to note, especially as a parent, when it comes to how gender is expressed in one's temperament or disposition, there's differences. Uh, there's differences. Uh, psychology tells us that one out of ten men will have a more feminine expression in their temperament, and one out of ten women will have a more masculine expression in their personality or temperament. And so what happens in our day, I think sometimes, is that a man has a more feminine temperament. He looks at other men, he says, I'm not normal. He goes to a therapist. The therapist says, oh, you have gender dysphoria. You need to transition. When in fact, God just created that man to be a little bit different, to be more sensitive. And research bears this out too, that men in helping professions, caring professions, that is, and, you know, psychologists and therapists and often pastors, have a more sensitive temperament because largely men are more interested in things and women are more interested in relationships. And some men have that sort of characteristics where they are very relational people. It doesn't mean that they're transgender. It means that God created them in a different way for a different purpose. What does scripture say about homosexuality? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Notice there's all forms of sexuality in this scripture. It's not just singling one group out. Romans 1, 26 through 27, Paul says this, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relationships for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relationships with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Homosexual behavior goes against our teleology. When you say, what's teleology? Teleology is the intent of design. It's the way that God designed our bodies to function. Now, Sometimes me and my family like to go out for just a drive. You ever go on a Sunday drive and take your car into a bayou or a lake and just try to drive underneath the water? Does that work well? Why? Well, because the teleology of a car is that it's meant to drive on the land. It doesn't work under the water. And so our, our teleological design is that, as Jesus said, as Genesis said, that it's man and woman. Now, Back in 2011, Lady Gaga, tremendous theologian, she sang this. She sang, well, I was born this way. And the first time I heard that, I said, well, aren't we all? Aren't we all born with a proclivity towards sin, a bent toward expressing our sexuality in a way that it wasn't meant to be expressed? Or to living our lives in a way that pleases us? We're all tempted. doesn't mean we act on those impulses. If you're following along with me in notes, let's talk about heterosexual sin. Heterosexuals get no free pass. A lot of, the lot of truth must illuminate all of our lives. Now, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the same measure, it will be measured unto you. I have seen Christians rail on homosexuality, but refuse to admit they have a problem with pornography or sexual sin in their own life. Let me remind you that sexual sin is sexual sin. That is to say... Any sin separates us from God. Now, there are differences in consequences. Some sins have far graver consequences than other sins, but sin is sin. It separates us from Christ. Can I remind us of this? That pornography is killing the church. That's killing marriages. That it's a generational problem that it's perpetuated. When I was in private practice as a therapist, one of my specialties, and I don't know how I got certain specialties, it just sort of develops was working with men trapped in sexual addiction. And I'd have men come and they would say, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Well, if you could stop, you would have already done it. So we have to deal with it. You've got to talk to someone. Things don't just change on their own. What about sex outside of a marital commitment? Scripture says this plainly. If you're not married 
and you're sleeping with someone, it's, it's, it's wrong. Well, we're committed. Well, if you're committed, get married. That's the ultimate expression of commitment. Put a ring on it. What about lust? Undressing someone with your eyes. Thinking about them in the way that you shouldn't. I've heard men say this a million times. Well, you can look, but you can't touch. Not according to Jesus. Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that anyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I want you to see we're not picking and choosing sins here. The scripture calls each and every one of us to the same standard, the same sexual ethic, even though we may struggle in a different way. And you say, well, Josh, why are you talking about this? Because it needs to be talked about. You know, we see sexuality everywhere in our culture. So why not we talk about it in church too? Ephesians 5, 3, it says this. Church, there shouldn't even be a hint of sexual immorality among you. That's what, that's what Paul says. Now, we're almost out of time, so we gotta, I got to talk fast and you got to listen fast. Amen? What's wrong with this slogan? I'm going to hit these points really quickly. Number one, it equates love with sex, and those two aren't the same. In fact, and I tell students this a lot, especially young ladies, that if someone really loved you in the truest form of the word, they're not going to ask you to do things that are harmful to you or that are, are against your, your wishes. It equates love with sex. What's the problem? It affirms sin. Love is love. All forms of sexual expression and gender are fine according to scripture. No, they're not. And this is where the church has to toe the line. Why? Because we want to be inflammatory? No, because we truly love people. As a Christian, I open scripture and it challenges me and it changes things in me that sometimes I don't want to change because they feed the flesh. However, I know what scripture says is good for me. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. And so I allow that to shape and change my mind. If I love people, I have to tell them the truth about what scripture says. What's wrong with the slogan? Well, it's, it's a lie. There are, in fact, limitations and restrictions on our sexuality. And you can't love someone with a lie. And it's high time that the American church, to use that term, is called to repentance for our own sexual sin and for being willing to affirm the sexual sin of our culture because it's easy to do and it doesn't cause any waves. You have to love people with the truth or you really don't love them. If you're not loving people with the truth, you can't say that you, don't, that, that you truly love them. Why well, is the slogan a problem? Because in our current sexual climate, it views babies as a burden. Our current sexual ethic says this, you can be as cavalier as you want, if you create a life, you can, and we use these sanitary words, you can terminate that pregnancy. Not snuff out a life, not destroy a human being, but you can terminate a pregnancy. What a tragedy that we've elevated our sexual desires above life itself. Why is the slogan a problem? I think it undercuts women's rights. If sex is a social construct, it makes no sense to stand up for women anymore because we don't even know what a woman is. What are we standing up for if anyone can be a woman? How do we protect what Paul calls the weaker vessel? Not weaker psychologically or emotionally, but in physical strength. For years and years and years, we've heard the saying that men and women are the same, the same, the same, the same. And we've seen that that's not the case. There are obvious differences rooted in biology. Now, as we close, can we have a better slogan, church? Instead of love is love, could we just say that God is love? And can I remind you this? My goodness, that he loves you so incredibly much. That he loves you in a way you'll never fully fathom. You can't. I tell my kids all the time, man, me and your mom love you so much, you'll never understand it until you have kids of your own. God loves you in such a way that you will never, you, you don't even have a category to categorize the love that God has for you. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. I want you to see that God has compassion for sinners such as myself, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us that while we were sinners, that Christ willfully agape and died for us. Salvation's the beginning. We have to continue to walk in the truth. God is love. I want you to see this second thought, that he loves you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes God's truth is hard for me to swallow. And sometimes it would be so much easier for me just to say, just to say, you know what, I don't know, you, you do you, and I'll do me and we'll all be happy. But that's not what God has called us to do as Christians. He's called us to speak the truth, and if you don't do it in a loving way, that's a problem. Scripture says they'll know us by our love. Some will contort Scripture and they'll make it say what they want. It happens today with sexuality as well. The Bible was once used to affirm and condone slavery. It didn't make it right. What you see is that God gives value to all people. Christianity provides the foundation for human rights. It elevates people. 
There's no person God does not value or love, and there's no person beyond the forgiveness of God. Last, I want you to see that the body is a good gift of God. So can I challenge you to love your body? To treat it like it was meant to be treated, to respect it, to use it, as Paul says, to honor God, to be concerned with how we treat our bodies and use them and other people as well, although their choices are their choices, all we can do is communicate what God's word says. Let me close out with a quote from Nancy Piercy. She says, Christianity assigns the human body dignity and value. Humans don't need freedom from the body to discover their true authentic self. Rather, we can celebrate our bodied existence as a good gift from God. Instead of escaping the body, the goal is to live in harmony with it. So where are you this morning? Can I, can I challenge you? Maybe you're in a place where you're living in unconfessed sin. Here's the simple solution to that. The Bible calls for us to repent. We've all had periods in our lives where we're living in a, a season of unconfessed sin. We, we deal with it. Maybe you are watering down sin because it's easy to do that. In your own life or in the life of someone you love, it's convenient to say, oh, it's okay, when in reality it's, it's not according to Scripture. Or maybe we're not standing on truth and we're letting culture push us, push us, push us, push us. Maybe we're scared of offending. Maybe we are offending because we don't speak truth in love. We speak in a hateful manner. Or maybe we're here this morning and we're simply not taking care of our bodies. And that could look many different ways. It could be how we eat. It could be, not, it could be abusing our body. It could be our, our dealing with our own sexual ethics. Let me remind you that God loves you. And it matters to him the way that you live. Because if you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you thankful that we can be here in your house, Lord. I'm thankful that we can learn and grow and be challenged by your word. And Lord, I know this, that there have been seasons of my life where I didn't want to receive the truth that you had for me because it's difficult sometimes. Lord, may we be a church and may the, the broader church toe the line on truth. May we stand for what is scriptural May we not compromise, but God, might we love people to the fullest extent. Lord, I pray that you would fill this house every Sunday with all of us as sinners, regardless of our sexuality, regardless of how we view the world, that we could come here and be loved on, but also be told the truth. God, we want you to know that we love you. We praise you for your goodness. Ask that you be with us. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. As we prepare to... Uh be dismissed in just uh, in just a moment. I want to say I know that you're also always so good to help us take down chairs. When we take down chairs today, we'll leave the center section and then take everything else down. So, thank you. So let's stand together. Let's let's be dismissed. This day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive.